Welcome everybody to episode on the ground. I'm Jesse Zerwell here with my co-host Misty Winston. This episode is the first in a deep dive series in which we'll investigate the silent genocide of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls uh, or MMIWG um, in the US and Canada, a pandemic that's plagued uh, the Northern Hemisphere for decades now, uh, but which received no coverage in mainstream media and scant attention in independent media. Um, we're honored to uh, begin this series with uh, Liza Black, who joins us today to unpack the historical context of the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Uh, Liza is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and an assistant professor of history and Native American and Indigenous Studies at Indiana University in uh, Bloomington. Uh, her book, Picturing Indians, Native Americans in Film, 1941 to 1960, uh, will be available uh, in October. Uh, you can purchase it for pre-sale right now. And uh, her second book is underway, um, and that one is focusing on the history of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Uh, Liza, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you so much. Um, OCO, this is Cherokee for hello. I want to start with a land acknowledgement. It's just something that um, indigenous people prefer to do and it's sort of really common in Canada and quite uncommon in the US and it sort of still shocks people. So I would just like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that I am situated on unceded Chumash territory. And I would like to acknowledge the past, present and future um, caretakers of this land as being the Chumash nation. I also want to give a big and heartfelt thank you to you, Jesse and Misty, for wanting to put this together and for caring about this issue, which as Jesse just said, is sort of ignored and overlooked by and large. I also want to thank Dina Giglio Whitaker for putting us in touch with each other. Um, and this sort of shows just how networked and sort of um, connected Native people are with each other and are with these issues. So I'm friends with Dina and it was really kind of her to recommend myself and my work, especially because this is such a new project. Um, and I don't consider myself an expert yet. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, and also just thank you for that introduction. So I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and uh, I find that a lot of non-Native people aren't really familiar with American Indian identity. And so being, uh, being a citizen means that I'm enrolled. So it's a sort of legal status that I occupy as a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, meaning, meaning that the Cherokee Nation sort of has a legal claim to claiming me as a citizen. Um, so we can talk more about that if you're interested in that, but I just wanted to sort of sure. make that clear what it means to be a citizen of a nation. Right. Um, I also wanted to sort of start with something funny, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, I really, Absolutely. I really, I really love comedy. Um, and what we're going to talk about is really sad. And um, I want to talk about that moment in fall 2018 when Matt Damon went on Saturday Night Live to mimic the Brett Kavanaugh hearing, when Brett Kavanaugh denied sexually assaulting a woman um, when he was a young man. Mm -hmm. And that skit was hilarious. Um, it has millions and millions of views on YouTube. And sort of as a historian, what I find so fascinating about Matt's skit is this idea that if a white male denies having committed a crime, it's true. Mm -hmm. Denial <laughs> functions as innocence in our culture. And right. that's really why that skit is so funny, right? Mm -hmm. Because Matt parodied Brett's sort of constant assertion, holding up his calendar saying, well, I have these calendars from when I was a young man and I never wrote down that I raped somebody. So right. if I didn't write it down, it didn't happen. Yeah. Right? So I find that so useful to think about because historians are sort of obsessed with evidence. You know, we love evidence. Right. And I, I feel like that's sort of part of the reason that this has not, that the crisis amongst indigenous women and girls has not been addressed is because from a historical viewpoint, 
if it's not documentable, then it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So that sort of erasure is is really important. Um, Yeah. 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 So I just wanted to start. And really the problem, the problem with history is that the the victors write it. And uh, so, you know, it it gets whitewashed quite a bit. Absolutely. And that is really true and funny story. (laughs) True and funny story. Yeah. Funny in a sad way, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then the media really sort of picks up on the tropes used by historians. So mm-hmm. it's this self-perpetuating cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, before we jump into sort of, you know, the historical um, aspect of missing and murdered Indigenous women and, um, you know, what has kind of brought us to this point, um, I did want to kind of hit our viewers and listeners with some st- st- statistics <laughs> um, kind of uh, um, to, just to give them a perspective of how severe um, and serious the issue really is. Um, so according to the National Crime Information Center, um, 5,712 cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls were reported in 2016 alone. Um, only 116 of those were logged in the DOJ database, which is insane. Um, In Canada, uh, a 2014 report released by the RCMP found that um, from 1980 to 2012, 1,181 Indigenous women and girls had gone missing and or or been murdered. Um, This would be the equivalent of uh, 20,000 non-Indigenous women and girls. Um, and then Am- Amnesty International has also reported that Indigenous women and girls are five times more likely to be to be murdered than non-Indigenous women of the same age. Um, and those statistics are staggering. Um, and, and some people may um, kind of wonder why, you know, we're taking a look at the history and all of this. But the truth is, is that something like this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and this is... Um, uh, something that has kind of, it, it's its just another uh, a form of oppression that has been facing um, the indigenous peoples in this country and in Canada and really around the world, um, you know, forever. Um, so we're really grateful to have you here to kind of discuss that and give people sort of um, a foundation of where this issue is coming from. Um, So we kind of wanted to start really at the beginning and, um, you know, what we're taught in school um, in this country, at least, um, about the founding of this country is, you know, that white people discovered what was already here and that, you know, what they found were these, you know, savage and uncivilized people and, you know, um, you know, we saved them and um, all of that is, you know, a massive lie. And so can you talk a little bit about... um, you know, what society was actually like in this country before, you know, the white settlers showed up and, um, you know, and, and, and how that lie has been perpetuated throughout history? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think it's really important to, um, to think about how that's really a mythology, what you've just described as more mythology, right? And that not only are children taught that, but there's all sorts of values that, are communicated through that story to kids, right? That non-native kids are taught to be really proud of that as well. So it's not just that certain facts are erased, it's that kids are taught pride about the founding of this country, right? And, And I think that's really clear with what we're seeing right now with conservatives, that they feel that pride is under attack. So it's not just that the storyline is being shifted, it's that the pride that sort of white supremacist pride is sort of being taken away from them. And this is what they are angry about. So in terms of what native life was like prior to contact, indigenous people were virtually everywhere. There's huge debates about what the population of the Americas was, uh, but there is clearly um, a sense amongst scholars that the population was incredibly high, especially in Central America and South America. And there's definitely agreement that genocide took place, disagreement about why and how, some saying it's mostly disease, some saying it's mostly slavery, some saying it's both. So in terms of pre-contact life in the Americas, it's just important to understand that all indigenous, indigenous space was everywhere on this continent. All space was claimed by, na- by a nation, 
And this is why it's so important to indigenous people today to strongly communicate the idea that you're always on native land. No matter where you are in the Americas, you're on native land. The history of how you ended up being there is crucial and complicated, but the fact is all of the Americas were indigenous spaces claimed by indigenous people um, and, and used by indigenous people and especially managed by indigenous people. Would you, trace that back uh, to even before the so-called founding of the United States to 1492 when uh, Columbus and his um, retinue ended up on Hispaniola. Um, would you say that there that that's there's a connection there uh, between you know his landing and his genocide against, uh, primarily the the Arawaks, um, and you know, then not so many centuries later, uh, you know, about less than two centuries later, the uh, the arrival of uh, white colonists to the U.S. Would you say that there's, you know, even though uh, Hispaniola, which is now the Dominican Republic and Haiti, isn't part of the uh, continental U.S., it's um, it's close and it it was you know where you know columbus thought he had found uh the uh the west indies so to speak so um even though it's not like directly linked to the founding of the united states would you say that there's a there's a connection there uh over the centuries Yes, absolutely. And I think that is another way in which indigenous genocide is erased in our school system, that we don't make those connections with Columbus. And that when Columbus is brought up in the school system, it's again a point of pride, right? And then certain facts are erased, especially the genocidal ones. So I think it's critical to think about Columbus, of course. And hooray for all the statues coming down recently. Uh, I think you could all watch <laughs> those videos over and over again. I mean, that is satisfying. Um, and then in, to tie it back to, 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 so of course I would include Hispaniola with the Americas, absolutely. Um, this is an excellent point. And then I also think it's sort of critical for those who haven't actually read Columbus's writings to take note that there is a description of the rape of a girl in his own writings in detail. Um, so this sort of sexual exploitation and sexual victimization of indigenous women and girls began with the c European conquest of Native America. Absolutely. And that's from, like, Columbus basically put it in his diary. You know, Brett Kavanaugh didn't write down when he sexually assaulted someone. But <laughs> Columbus himself wrote this out in, in detail. And it's, it's fairly disgusting. It's a fairly disgusting description of the sexual assault of a young, of a girl. And so what happened after, you know, you know, after contact, um, it, there seemed to be um, this, you know, like you've said before, the, this kind of white supremacy um, attitude um, that was extremely pervasive and, and, and really the goal from you know, the very beginning was to erase the indigenous population in whatever way possible. Um, that's taken many iterations over the course of history. Um, I mean, you've seen things like the adoption program and, you know, the boarding schools and things like that. Um, so it, it, it just kind of seems like, you know, as we talk about the missing and murdered indigenous women, like this is just the next chapter. The, it's, you know, a, a new cover on, the, on, on an old book um, of another form of the same oppression. Would you agree that that's the case? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as staggering as those statistics are that you brought up at the beginning, where basically the majority, definitely the majority of Native women are survivors of sexual violence and other types of violence. Even though the, that's so staggering, it absolutely goes back to the founding of the United States and other countries in the Americas. So yes, that, that connection is absolutely there. It's absolutely based in history. I think it's also important to think about the doctrine of discovery, that this is sort of the intellectual sort of mapping that Europe used against indigenous peoples of the Americas to claim that they have a legal and religious right to land in the Americas. I mean, this was sort of the number one intention 
of European empires was to dispossess native people of their most valuable resource, which was the land itself. Um, so absolutely, there's a connection there. And the idea that land was for the taking, that native land was there for the taking by European empires, I believe that same logic and fallacy was applied to the bodies of indigenous women and girls. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a good point, and that's a good um, a good link, a good link to make um, that the conquest, the the imperialism, uh, you know, this just unfettered uh, taking of land and resources. Um, does not come without, you know, the same sort of behavior applied to to the bodies of the people who are being oppressed. Um, and, and, and in this case, it's it's particularly women. Um, but just on the sort of uh, discovery point that you brought up, um, I think it's important, too, to bring up the fact that the Spanish conquistadors did much of the same uh, in Mexico and, you know, what we call Latin America now, um, as uh, white settler colonials did in, uh, you know, what's called America now. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you can briefly speak to that, uh, because that often gets overlooked, like, um, you know, Cortez and, and, and those so-called um, discoverers that were taught about in elementary school and, and middle school, you know, again, they're portrayed as heroes, but if you read uh, an, an honest history of, of their, uh, their conquests, it's uh, just as genocidal as what uh, white settler colonials uh, have done in, in the U.S. So, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if you can, if you can speak to that at all. Absolutely. Great question. Um, and actually, if I could just tie it back in with something Misty asked earlier about pre-contact life in the Americas, um, I just want to contrast pre-contact pre life for Native people in the Americas with especially the Spanish, like you just talked about, to point out that scholars are showing that rape really was not a reality in pre-contact America, that amongst Indigenous people, um, rape was not a word in, in native languages. Rape was not a reality. Um, and in the rare cases where we think maybe this was because we see legal precedent for punishment of indigenous people who were rapists, um, it's, it's fairly clear that this was mostly an unknown concept as well as pedophilia, other types of sexual violence as well. So I think that's really key to understanding just how literally foreign this was to indigenous people to not even be able to comprehend what these adult European men were inflicting upon the female members of their community. So yes, with the Spanish, you absolutely can find many, many examples amongst these men that children are taught to admire and idolize and write reports about in school. Um, you can find many examples, proof, right? Going back to the Brett Kavanaugh example, you can find proof in their own words, in their own archives, that these rapes and acts of violence took place. Um, I live in California and the mission system is still upheld as this point of pride in California. Children are still forced in fourth grade to do this mission project, which is just all about idolizing the Spanish and, and really the Catholic Church as well. In fact, in the town where I live, Ventura, California, we have a statue of a man who was the builder of the mission system, Father Sarah, who the Catholic Church decided to make a saint. And we have round the clock Catholics out there praying around his statue in town, trying to prevent protesters from taking it down. <laughs> so not only did these men commit crimes that were not punished in the past, 
we are being indoctrinated to believe that these men are heroes when they're criminals. Yeah, yeah. I, we, Jesse and I were actually just talk, talking about this um, earlier about how it's really sick that we glorify these people. Um, we were talking about, you know, Andrew Jackson and how he, you know, would brag about using, um, you know, the scalps of indigenous uh, uh, people as the reins for his army's horses. Um, and, and there are statues to that man in this country. And that's, it, it really speaks to how, um, uh, just kind of sick the mindset is and, um, you know, the things that we choose to glorify in this country. Um, and it, and it's, um, it's something that we really, and I'm glad that you're here talking about this, um, because it, it really needs to be discussed more. I think it's, it's something that, you know, just does not get talked about at all. And, um, you know, it, the fact that there are statues to these people, they should all come down. And, and I'm so happy, like you said, it's so nice. Um, I'm in Ohio, just outside of Columbus, and we, we just took down our Columbus statue. And it's, it's so um, just amazing to see. And, um, and it's, well, it's long overdue. So, I mean, that, that it's just, it's really, and again, it's, you know, it's a statue. It's not anything, you know, concrete. It's not, you know, policy. It's not, you know, anything like that, but it is a step. So that, that has been really nice to see. It has been. I, I, as a Cherokee, of course, I'm very, very in favor of Andrew Jackson coming down everywhere in every form. But I believe that his was another statue that was being protected. I believe it's been taken mm -hmm. somewhere else or there's some kind of structure around it to protect it. So I'm entirely against that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's grotesquely ironic that um, these statues are so protected, but actual human beings, uh, you know, yeah, you know, they're just not, you know, whatever, whatever example you want to take, you know, why is a statue more important than a person? Um, but I think that's because, you know, statues represent an ideology that certain people want to protect and, um, you know, they're, they're symbols that they want to uh, preserve so they can, uh, you know, continue preserving their ideology. Um, so I wanted to ask you about sort of white conquest uh, throughout the centuries from, I guess, 1492 um, onward. Uh, Mostly it was about the conquest of land and natural resources, correct, from, from the get-go. And, um, and they pursued white settler colonialists. They pursued this in the name of their, their self-made myth that they were civilizing uh, a savage land and people. Um, can you talk about uh, how important the, the the theft of these the land and the resources uh was and has been to um uh the people who are uh, oppressing um you know not just in indigenous people in general but uh indigenous women especially um you know just to bring it up to contemporary times you have a lot of places in, in the United States, for example, where they have these so-called man camps and, you know, these white men are, they come to work whatever sorts of jobs and, um, you know, they just think they have carte blanche with uh, the indigenous women in, in the area. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about that part of it because it's not, uh, you know, it's not just about, you know, we think these people are inferior and we, that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. It's about, you know, material gain uh, in the end. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm wondering if you can talk about that. Absolutely. The, these are great questions. And I mean, I think what is happening in this conversation is we're trying to create these connections between right. history and, and, and also question the history we've been taught and sort of replace that with something that's more accurate. And then also answer questions about how capitalism 
has been fueled by settler colonialism, how mm -hmm. capitalism has been tied to racism, um, how greed and profit sort of maybe can't, wouldn't have existed without the exploitation of people and resources. So something I like to say to my students in class is, imagine if you started a business where the real estate was free and the workers were free. All you had to come up with was a good idea. Of course your business would be successful. How could it not? How could you not turn a profit on that model, right? Um, and that's essentially what happened in America. That Americans, meaning white Americans, were able to start a business with free land and free labor. And and we're seeing a pretty good business model. <laughs> Exactly. And, and yet they call that capitalism and they call that free market. I mean, I would question that. I mm -hmm. would question that. I don't see that as being a free market. How is that a free market? When I, I'm still waiting to see what I, what they call a free market. It doesn't seem to me to be free, but maybe, maybe this is sort of going off on a tangent. Um, but to, to answer your question about how the United States claimed land. Yes, of course, the United States had a material reason for doing so. They, they layered on this sort of um, veneer of religion, but really they're sort of using religion as a way of propping up what is just unabashed greed in taking what was not theirs, what belonged mm -hmm. to indigenous people, and then generating tremendous wealth from that resource. Um, to just sort of give your, your listeners a few ideas if they want to pursue this, and especially for the visual learners out there. I'm a visual person. Um, there's, uh, let me see if I can just pull it up without. Um, if you go to landgrabu.org, this is an incredible resource. Um, this indigenous geographer and a historian came up with this model for looking at specifically land grant universities and the mm -hmm. land grant system. So this isn't addressing all land theft in the United States, it's addressing sort of one particular moment as a result of the Morrill Act. But you can literally go to any place in the United States and see exactly how the land grant system stole land from indigenous people. And it's just visually like an astounding resource. Um, so, so without a doubt, the United States was land hungry and land greedy and truly stole land from indigenous people, often with treaties that were um, not consensual, to sort of tie it back in with, with rape and violence. These okay. were often non-consensual treaties. Sometimes they were not ratified. Um, sometimes alcohol would be distributed at treaty gatherings. So there's all sorts of ways in which the land grab was entirely unethical. Um, so, so yes, I hope I've answered your question and, and agreed with well, you. Well, and I think that that's that, also something that we're still seeing today. I mean, we see it with the pipelines. Um, you know, this is like we, like I said before, this is really just a continuation of the same oppression that's been going on. It's the same land grab that's been going on. Um, they want the land. And I think that that actually really does, I, I, I wish I could remember the woman's name. I was watching a a documentary film um, about the missing and murdered indigenous woman. And an elder was saying that, um, uh, you know, it was about Canada. And she was saying, you know, I know we know what the Canadian government wants. They want the land and a better way to get the land and, you know, to destroy our people than to attack our women and our girls. And that's such a powerful thought because it's so true. And, um, you know, I think that that's it's really just something that we see you know, going on now with Standing Rock and, you know, all of these things, it, it really is just a, a, a power and a land grab and a resource grab and um, by, by any means necessary. Yes, absolutely. Um, and there's even evidence to give your, another, your readers another resource. Sarah Deer is an incredible uh, Muskogee scholar and attorney who wrote a book called The Beginning and End of Rape, just a critical, critical read and look into this. Um, and one of the points she makes there which I think sort of we haven't amplified enough as historians, is the idea that some conflict, meaning uh, violent conflict between tribal groups and the United States, was really the result of rape, of 
European men raping indigenous women. And so some of the wars that we talk about as being these sort of national conflicts between tribes and the United States are actually indigenous men trying to stop the rape of indigenous women. Um, for example, the Dakota War, something that um, is an incredibly painful chapter for in Dakota people. There is evidence that there was rape going on of European men upon indigenous women and that this was retaliation for that. Um, for some reason, something you said made me think of that. So, so I'm very interested in exploring that as a historian. And you are absolutely right to point out that these all male spaces in these man camps are incredibly dangerous. These are men who are in all male spaces, meaning they're living in dorm sort of rooms or trailers with other men, most of whom are not, who are white. So not only are they not native, they're not usually um, from other minority groups. And they're in really rural locations that are often close to indigenous communities. So this is just an explosion of violence that we see in these sorts of physical spaces. It's incredibly dangerous to indigenous women and girls, both in terms of rape, in terms of disappearance, and in terms of sex trafficking. Absolutely. And um, just going off of that point, I wanted to ask about uh, sort of the various acts of resistance that uh, indigenous peoples have, uh, have carried out. Um, mostly in the 20th century. Uh, so I'm thinking of um, the uh, Ames occupation of Alcatraz in, in the 1970s, um, what happened at Pine Ridge, um, and uh, specifically with Pine Ridge, there's the murder of Anime Akwash, which I don't think has ever been solved as far as I've been able to research. Um, but I, you know, is sort of exemplary of, of what we're talking about here. Um, just, she was an activist. She was only 30. Uh, she was shot multiple times and basically left on the side of the road in, in the Pine Red, Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, but all of this is to say that, that people have, our indigenous peoples have been fighting back and resisting since the beginning. And I'm wondering if you think that there's been any sort of, I don't want to say benefit because I think there, there's always a benefit to resisting, but you know, like how, how much do you think ha it, it has yielded them, you know, uh, in a positive way? Um, and how much of it has increased um, sort of like FBI goon squad tactics against them? That's a great question, sort of measuring the metrics of what is the positive impact. And that's such a social science-y kind of question. And um, I don't really think of myself as a social scientist. Um, but, to, but to answer the question, I mean, yes, there's this incredible story of resistance in the 20th century. Um, and a lot of that is in reaction to something I didn't really sort of draw out much with Misty's point or question earlier about family, the history of the indigenous family. Um, and I do want to sort of maybe highlight that for just a moment before we talk about resistance. So that is to say that not only were indigenous children separated from their parents as a result of boarding schools, so many of your viewers might not know, but in the late 19th century, boarding schools became um, the dominant policy of the United States against indigenous people. Um, I like to call this family separation policy because it sort of resonates with what we're seeing today with our immigrant community. Um, so the boarding school was um, a place that was separating native children from their parents Native children would be taken hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from their families, um, where not necessarily would they have any communication with their families. Some children had access to their families and communication with them. Other children did not. So this was a horrifying moment in American Indian history 
children were truly and deeply traumatized. And we talk about intergenerational trauma from the boarding school life, um, where we see that children, indigenous children, were abused by the teachers, by the administrators, by the superintendents, physically abused, sexually abused, psychologically abused, virtually. And then for those who didn't actually receive beatings or sexual assaults, all indigenous students were forced to stop speaking their language and to speak English. So this created a sort of cultural genocide in indigenous communities that has ramifications today in terms of language loss, in terms of breakdowns in family structure, in terms of folks processing trauma. So I just wanted to make sure we, we got to that point that Misty brought up earlier that I didn't really develop. And then what we're talking more about now as scholars is connecting that trauma that happened to indigenous children in terms of being separated from their parents and their culture and their language with the continuing policy of adopting out native kids. So in Canada, it's called the 60s scoop, if anybody wants to Google that term and learn more about it. Um, in Canada, it's called the 60s scoop. This would entail native children being photographed and advertised in newspapers as being up for adoption. These were children who were taken oftentimes against their parents' will. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is, this is another way in which the social welfare system, which purports to do good, is actually doing tremendous harm. Mm -hmm. um, so this is documented in Margaret Jacobs, two books on the issue of adoption, um, a great podcast about the 60s scoop and about missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in Canada is the Finding Cleo podcast. If folks want to sort of pursue some of these avenues into learning more about it. So, so really, I think it's helpful to think about this late 20th century resistance that Jesse was talking about with AIM, with Alcatraz, with Pine Ridge, with Anime Aquash. And then you could also talk about the anti-policing movement in the American Indian movement in Minneapolis. So I think it's really important to realize that when you see this sort of um, upswelling of indigenous resistance, that for indigenous people, that's against this backdrop of not only the sort of general genocide of indigenous people in the Americas beginning in 1492, but also specifically how these genocidal policies have targeted families and broken down indigenous family structures. Well, and I think it's almost a, it's a cultural genocide. And I'm glad that you brought up um, the boarding schools and adoption. This is something Jesse and I have been talking about a lot, actually. It's something that I, I've been really kind of um, focused on and passionate about. Um, uh, I don't think that a lot of people realize that the goal of the boarding schools and of the adoption program was to um, destroy indigenous culture, to take away... Um, I mean, like you said, they were forced to, they weren't allowed to speak their language. They had, they were forced to get their hair cut. They weren't allowed to see their families. Um, they were, I think, uh, I don't remember it, if it was, uh, I don't know if it was Pratt, was his name, Pratt, Richard Henry Pratt. Was he the one that said that it was uh, uh, kill the Indian, save the man or something to that effect? I mean, it was literally a goal to um, destroy the culture of the indigenous people and assimilate them into white culture. And I don't think that a lot of people recognize how um, damaging that was to the indigenous population. I mean, these kids were literally stolen from their families, um, taken, you know, like you said, hundreds, thousands of miles away. And, um, you know, at 16, they're then, you know, let out and they are were lost. They had no connection to their heritage. They hadn't seen their families. Um, and it was incredibly damaging. And I, I think that's just, it's just, it's never talked about. And um, I think that's probably one of, and I think it's maybe because I'm a mom that that bothers me so much. And that's been kind of what I've really been so focused on, but it, it's, I can't imagine what that would do to a community. Yeah, I, and I really appreciate you bringing up the, the motherhood angle of it because 
I think this is more and more becoming sort of a salient point in the MMIWG movement is that these are women oftentimes who are mothers. And so their children are growing up without their mothers. So there is a way in which this is sort of part of the history of the indigenous family and the refusal of the United States to validate the rights of indigenous parents to raise their children and to raise them in the ways that they see as best. So I think that for non-native people, there's so much implicit trust in the government. And there's so much (laughs) implicit trust in the educational system and in social workers and in the police that it's hard to believe that this was the policy of the United States and that for for me i don't i don't care what they called it i don't care what motives they gave i don't care if they say well we're giving them christianity i believe i believe it sort of doesn't matter what they called it i don't believe it matters why they said they were doing it i believe on some level they knew this was destroying indigenous people from the inside out really absolutely no question <laughs> absolutely and uh, I also want to touch on the point that um, the uh, resistance movements that we mentioned earlier um, have resulted in uh, political prisoners in in the United States uh, and in Canada, but um, specifically thinking of Leonard Peltier. Um, and uh, he... Um, he was on the Pine Ridge. He lived on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is also where uh, Anime Akwash's body was found. Um, so that was a really, um, I don't think linchpin is the right word. It was like a, it, it was like a locus of, of resistance of, of American, of uh, indigenous people's resistance. And uh, n- Still not a lot of people know about that or, you know, what even happened. And, you know, there were two FBI agents who were killed and, uh, you know, there is no um, concrete evidence that points to Peltier's uh, guilt. And um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk about what happened there um, briefly, the standoff and then, you know, what happened to Leonard Peltier, who's been in prison for over 40 years now with you know, worsening health problems. Um, I think, uh, you know, that that ties into a lot of what we're talking about. It's it's another form of this uh, this repression um, that also involves uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't know that I can say a lot more about it other than what you said. I mean, what you've said has really sort of nicely laid out what happened there. I mean, um, the only thing I would add is that this moment at Pine Ridge was an incredibly divisive moment, that not only did you have federal agents as agents of violence who were heavily armed on the Pine Ridge Reservation, but you also had this division within the tribal community where you had um, council members who seemed to be on the side, in a sense, of the federal government. So you can sort of see how divide and conquer played out Mm -hmm. in the resistance movement at that moment at Pine Ridge, in that the federal government quite ably divided Native people against Native people, and all of them had weapons. Right. So, So that's another issue, is that the federal government has always done that as well is introduced division in tribal communities by sort of rewarding certain members of tribal communities who then work with the federal government, right? And then those who are against that position now become an enemy of the enemy, right? Right. So, and and there's many, many historical examples of that. So that's all I would add to um, the terrible and sad story of Leonard Peltier, you know, and there's just constant hope that some president will come along and acquit him or pardon him and release him from prison. It just, it hasn't, it hasn't happened. And so certainly that's a cost. You know, you asked earlier, well, what what were the benefits of this resistance in the late 20th century? 
what were the benefits and what were the costs? That would certainly be a cost, is that activists went missing, like Anna Mae, mm -hmm. that activists ended up in prison, like Leonard Peltier. And I think that's something that you see with it, with movements across the board, not just in, I mean, you see that with Black Lives Matter. I mean, tons of Black Lives Matter activists have, you know, ended up committing suicide or going missing or whatever. Um, I think that's something that, you know, they do, they do kind of across the board. Um, and they're very good at it. <laughs> they're very effective. It works really well. Um, the be one benefit, though, that I failed to mention earlier is the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, ICWA. I think it's really important to mention that that Indigenous women uh, from Spirit Lake specifically were the sort of um, force behind ICWA being passed. So ICWA is federal legislation to protect Indian children from being taken from their parents by either the social welfare system or by adoption agencies. So this was the result of indigenous mothers, many of whom had their children taken from them by the court system or by adoption agencies, oftentimes entirely illegally. And these women went to Congress, they testified before Congress, their kids even came with them to Congress, sobbing, telling these horrible stories of what happened to them in foster care and or by their adoptive, their white adoptive parents. So ICWA was passed as a result of tremendous activism on the part of especially indigenous women to protect families and to especially protect native mothers and to protect their rights to raise their own children. And of course, as you can guess, it's being questioned and challenged mm -hmm. by conservative forces, by conservative think tanks, with conservative funds at the Supreme Court. Yeah, uh, I'm not surprised at that. Uh, that's that's par for the course. Um, but speaking of um, legal, uh, I guess, legal repressions upon indigenous peoples, uh, I wanted to discuss the uh, Oliphant v. Uh, Suquamish Indian tribe uh, Supreme Court case from 1978, which ruled that tribes did not have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian perpetrators. Um, and in 2013, apparently, uh, in the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, um, this problem was uh, somewhat corrected by providing federal federally recognized tribes with special domestic violence uh, criminal jurisdiction. Um, which allows them to meet certain conditions uh, to prosecute certain cases involving non-Indian offenders, which is very vague and seems like not a solution to anything. So uh, I'm wondering if you can talk about the impact of that that Supreme Court decision um, and how it plays into uh, the the pandemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Awesome question. Thank you. Um, and if I can just give a little plug for a class that I just got approved by my university in Indiana, it's called How to Get Away with Murder. So oh, awesome. I got away with calling my class How to Get Away with Murder. Um, and so I think your, your question <laughs> ties in really nicely with that, because basically I would argue it's never really been illegal in this country to kill a Native person. It's never really been illegal in this country to rape an Indigenous woman. It, the, the, this is de facto legal by the fact that they are not prosecuted. So in that sense, to answer your question about Oliphant, it's really just sort of an outgrowth of what was already true culturally and socially, which mm -hmm. is a non-native, usually man, cannot be convicted of a crime against an indigenous person. Even if they yeah. committed a crime, even if that crime can be proven with evidence, to go back to my joke at the beginning about evidence, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter in the crucible of white supremacy. It doesn't matter. And so Oliphant is, as you said, it's a, it's a Supreme Court case that took, that stripped sovereignty from tribes, essentially. It takes sovereignty from tribes. It says tribes don't have the right to prosecute those who harm citizens of their nation. 
So it's an assault on tribal sovereignty. And Sarah Deer really makes this so clear in that amazing book that I love teaching, that any assault on tribal sovereignty, sovereignty is an assault on tribal women. Mm -hmm. Right? So, Absolutely. right. And so not only Oliphant, but other, other actions, other legal actions have systematically suppressed tribal sovereignty and systematically protected white criminals. It has made it impossible to convict a white criminal. And, and this is primarily the root of the problem of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. It is mostly intertribal, I mean, uh, interracial. It is mostly non-native men assaulting native women and girls. This is really unusual for violent crimes. Typically, they're intraracial. Uh, this is another point Sarah Deer sort of spells out really, really carefully. So, so that's my answer to your question, that these assaults on tribal sovereignty end up being an assault on the protection of Native women and Native girls. Yeah. Well, and it really just seems to make it like a jurisdictional nightmare. Um, there, there really isn't, I mean, you, you, there are some situations where you have to call, you know, this agency and so, and it, and it really just seems almost intentional that it's, it's been made, um, to be very convoluted and chaotic to even deal with these issues. Um, and, and, you know, the jurisdictional red tape and, and all of that madness is just really compounding the issue in such a terrible way. And it seems like it would be such an easy fix. Um, so it, you can't help but think that it's, it's an intentional, uh, a th an intentional thing. Right. And, and I often ask my students, um, just to go back to my, to my way in which I teach is that I ask my students to imagine, can you imagine being in another country and not being subject to their laws? <laughs> Right. And, and yet yeah. there, there's this there's this idea I find amongst non-natives. They seem to believe that they are absolutely under jurisdiction of a tribe if they're on tribal land. They're, they're essentially not because there's so many ways in which tribes have been robbed of their own authority over themselves, over their person, over their belongings, over their homes and over their land. Yeah. And, and that brings up. Uh the the BIA, which I, I would like to talk about, because, um, you know, not not only have they been around for many decades, but they've become sort of like, if you look at uh, the genocide that's happening against the Palestinians, they're kind of like the Palestinian authority of, of indigenous peoples. Um, you know, on they have this patina of maintaining the well-being of, of their their people, but they're actually quite corrupt and um, sometimes or maybe often work in concert with uh, federal authorities. So um, can you talk about just um, what the BIA is and, and how it's been mostly uh, detrimental to uh, indigenous peoples? Yes, absolutely. So for those who are listening and don't know what the BIA is, it's an acronym for Bureau of Indian Affairs. And as Jesse just explained, this is an arm of the federal government. And there really is no possibility in my mind that there's any arm of the federal government that was ever created to help or protect or um, defend indigenous people, even if that's what their so-called mission is, it, it, that's a lie. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs was created to manage, to control indigenous people, and especially in indigenous space, meaning on tribal, historic tribal lands, but also especially reservations. So you can't sort of separate the BIA from the reservation system. And the reservation system, likewise, was never meant to protect to um, increase the health and strength of indigenous communities. The reservation system was intended to break indigenous people, to break indigenous communities. And the reservation system by the federal government's own admission in the Miriam report 
generated tremendous poverty where there had not been poverty. Yeah, so, absolutely. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Pine Ridge Reservation is uh, one of the poorest areas in uh, the so-called United States. Is that right? It is correct. And a lot of indigenous activists sort of are pushing back against Pine Ridge being used as the sort of representation of indigenous poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and there's sort of pushback to sort of talk about other types of indigenous communities and reservations where there is economic strength, where there are indigenous businesses, reservation businesses that are thriving. So um, I sort of want to just, you know, point to that and, and say, yes, there's tremendous poverty and tremendous unemployment in some indigenous communities. And then and then you have other situations in other communities. So um, but yes, that is absolutely true. And in some indigenous communities, you have um, unemployment as high as 90 percent. And then you have other indigenous communities that um, are tremendously wealthy, for example, the Seminole Nation, which. Mm -hmm they're tremendously wealthy because of the hard rock. So, so there, there is diversity even in indigenous communities, but, but yes, the reservation system certainly was not created to, to create wealthy Indians. Right. <laughs> that was right. definitely not the intention. The intention was to destroy native America, whether uh, or not they put that in writing, because as I said, Kavanaugh, <laughs> Wait, right. but if he tried it down, he didn't do it. <laughs> um, totally. <laughs> this is this is a little tangential, but uh, just because you said Indians right now, um, you know, there's a lot of people. Someone like myself, for example, I, I, I don't know if I should say Indians or Native Americans or Indigenous peoples, and you know, what do you know, what do you, what do people in your, in your community prefer to be, I, I don't like to say labeled either, but you know, what, do, what do they prefer to be called, you know, uh, outside of Cherokee? Yeah. I mean, this is um, becoming an answer that is getting longer and longer every time I answer this question. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm really happy that we didn't answer this until the end. Um, because usually my answer to that is, you know what, there's really important things to talk about, and that is not the most important thing. So I'm glad that we've addressed important issues in Native America first, and now at the end we're talking about sort of naming. Um, so I would say the best answer to that is to, to just always use somebody's tribal affiliation, if you okay. can, and then, you know, to use it correctly. Um, and to use the tribal affiliate, the tribal name that the tribe prefers to use. There's many examples of tribes being named in ways that they don't prefer by by Europeans. And so it's always best to use the tribal affiliation and to use it in the way that that tribe prefers. And then in terms of sort of lumping all indigenous people together, um, native people tend, or at least like over the 20th century, a lot of indigenous people in the United States were and are okay with Indians with each other. Mm -hmm. I think in non-native environments, especially in the school system, the one act of respect that children were taught was to say Native American, right? They weren't taught anything else. <laughs> they don't know anything else about indigenous yeah. people, but they do know that you're not supposed to say Indian. Yeah. And that, that sounds wrong to them. And it sounds disrespectful to them. So I sort of respect that non-native kids were raised with that and that for them it feels right to say native american and i think that's totally fine yeah but there's also i think uh a contradiction in that term you know with the american part as in like <laughs> yeah. th this wasn't america uh when indigenous peoples were living here before like we said like pre-contact um so it's it's always been a contradictory term to me and um i just think you know when you're when we're talking about these issues the language is important uh especially out of respect for for the people you know we're we're discussing um so yeah i just wanted to get your perspective on that and and you know what what indigenous peoples prefer and i guess as you said it's kind of like it depends on your tribal affiliation and 
Well, I think there's a generational thing, too, where now older indigenous people are still OK with Indian with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they would probably be OK with an ally using that term. I think maybe with Gen Z, that's starting to shift. And Gen Z, I'm sort of noticing, is less comfortable with Native American and much more comfortable with Native or Indigenous. So mm -hmm. there's sort of a generational issue there as well. And then if I can just bring up Kavanaugh one more time. Yeah, uh, never, the, get, never, the, never get tired yeah, of never, him. I never get sick of making fun of him. Uh, <laughs> On the recent, uh, the very first like Zoom Supreme Court hearing, because of the pandemic, they televised mm -hmm. it or didn't televise it. They recorded it and and did a live stream online. Um, he was and and the it was McGirt. I think it was McGirt versus Oklahoma. So I heard him giving his anti Indian position sort of remarks, right, where he was making the argument that Oklahoma is not indigenous land because so many white people were there at the turn of the century. And he kept saying Indians, he kept saying Indians. And it really bothered me, I noticed him saying Indians, right? right. Because <laughs> he so clearly is not an ally. He was so clearly making an anti-indigenous argument that when he said Indians, I was like, yeah. stop saying that. You know? <laughs> but, but when an ally says it, I don't mind at all. <laughs> Yeah. I'm actually really glad you brought up the Oklahoma thing because we were going to ask you about that. I know it's not really related to what we're discussing today, but um, given that we have you here, it, it, um, it's like, like a huge announcement that just came out. Um, so we're just wondering kind of what your take is on that. Um, um, what do you think the implications are? Um, do you see this as, you know, a step in the right direction? Uh, you know, like what, what do you what do you kind of feel about it? It is so connected, Misty, because it ties right back with what we were just talking about True. with Oliphant. You know, in that this is about jurisdiction. Ultimately, these are fights over jurisdiction and jurisdiction is about tribal sovereignty. So it's absolutely connected. And you might want to take a listen or your listeners might want to take a listen to Sarah Deer's interview that she just did, I believe, this morning with Democracy Now! about McGirt, where she is explaining exactly what this means legally. Now, I'm in a private Cherokee group on Facebook where all we do is fight and gossip. And... <laughs> So the fighting already started this morning where you That's have, uh, for anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you, have, you have Cherokee saying like, this is wrong, you know, um, and, and just putting out all this misinformation. So I won't even repeat the misinformation, but the truth of McGirt and the truth, the truth of the ruling is that it is affirming, this case is affirming tribal jurisdiction and tribal land rights in certain, in basically Eastern Oklahoma for the Muscogee, also known as Creek Nation. So that is in essence what it's doing, right? So to just restate that really simply, what this, what this means potentially is that indigenous people, specifically the Creek Nation, so citizens of Creek Nation, when they are on Creek land, which now has been reaffirmed, right? They would be tried by a federal system for their crimes rather than by local authorities in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So that might seem sound really bizarre to people. Like, why is that? Why does that matter? Because any strengthening of tribal sovereignty is a win for indigenous people. Absolutely. And this is really, really confusing to people in the Cherokee group because they see this as a loss. Mm -hmm. They see this as a loss and they see this as a system out of control. This is not a loss. This is not a system out of control. This is absolutely a win. And in fact, these criminals, these indigenous <laughs> criminals will actually probably receive harsher sentences because they'll be they'll be sentenced in federal court mm -hmm. rather than state or local court. So it's not that indigenous people, there's this idea that indigenous people are trying to get away with something that indigenous people sort of won't punish indigenous criminals. This is just totally false. And, and this idea is just constantly put out by states and by the federal government against indigenous people, right? To say, oh, indigenous people can't possibly prosecute their own. Of course they, of course we can. Yeah. In fact, to go back to your question about what was pre-contact life like, well, there was, there probably wasn't rape. <laughs> There probably right. wasn't rape. And when this did become a reality, tribal councils did severely punish indigenous rapists far more extensively than the 
than the United States government ever has. So it, so it is connected. It absolutely is connected. And, and it could yep, lead to right. further positive moves. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I was just, I was, I, the one thing I find curious about it, given the Supreme Court uh, roster is, you know, it's like a very, I suppose you could say liberal decision for a very conservative uh, su Supreme Court panel. Um, so part of me was just wondering if it's, you know, a political strategy um, or if they actually do care about the welfare of uh, indigenous peoples. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, guess what? As I've been saying this whole time, I don't believe, even if they were to say we care, I would not believe them. I mean, I just wouldn't believe it. So no, I do not think it's a result of them not caring. I think it's a result of tremendous evidence to demonstrate mm -hmm. that this is Creek land. I mean, that was essentially what they had to prove with the, was that this is Creek land and Congress never officially, legally spelled out the end of the Creek reservation. So the Creek Nation just basically proved that. They yeah. proved it. Right? They, they, used, they used American law to show that this was still Creek land. So it definitely, um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily then, like you, see this as a liberal decision. I would see this as a conservative court that had to admit by their own method, a legal method of legal proof, that, that their case had been proven. And the right. other thing I would uh, point to is the repercussions of this. Because in their decision, they sort of keep talking about how Congress didn't dissolve the reservation. Congress didn't X. Congress didn't X. Which to me is sort of setting them up to say, now Congress will, right? Mm -hmm. they, they've made it clear Congress did not take these acts. And I feel like almost the fallout will be that Congress will take those actions. I feel like it's also been a lot of really hard work from indigenous activists to get to this point. The same way with uh, DAPL recently being uh, shut down, at least, you know, for some time. Um, right. I, I'm always like really, um, uh, I don't know, impressed um, by the indigenous activists. Um, like I, we've been in contact with like Rosalie Fish um, to, to speak on uh, on the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and it, there, it, it's just, it's, it's just really the community aspect of it. And, um, you know, it, it's just really, uh, it gives me some hope, I guess. <laughs> it gives me some hope <laughs> for the future. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because I feel like that is sort of the saddest thing to me about media representations of indigenous people and historical representations of indigenous people. It's just that America, meaning non-Native America, is just so unaware of indigenous pain. They're just so unaware of the history of indigenous pain and so disconnected from that. And then likewise, they're disconnected from indigenous love. Like they don't realize, they don't know how deeply indigenous people love each other, how deeply indigenous families um, fight to stay together and fight to take care of each other. And so, yes, there is sort of an infinite base of care and concern and compassion in indigenous communities that, that gives rise to this activism that um, is small but powerful. What, what do you say, uh, just going off of that, what do you say to people, uh, and I, I've heard this pretty often, and it seems like it's from people who just don't want to engage with the argument, but what do you say to people nowadays who argue, well, the country is what it is, you know, we can't go back, There's, we can't do reparations. Um, you know, the same issue comes up with, with black slavery as well. Um, you know, what, what, what do you say, what's your response to those people who just kind of have this like historical analysis and just, um, you know, their imaginations fail them with regard to uh, reparations or, or what have you. Right. I mean, their ancestors' imaginations didn't fail them. Their yeah. ancestors found a way to, you know, steal a, steal a continent and then steal the people of a continent to generate tremendous wealth mm -hmm. on a stolen continent. So, so the lack of imagination was, I mean, the, the lack of the imagination, that is, that is new. That is new. 
because, you know, the power is shifting and the conversation is shifting and voices are being heard finally. So, so the lack of imagination, that is this, that is false. That is false, right? I mean, they just don't like what is being proposed. Right, right. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, it's, if you're somebody who, who doesn't know the history of what's happened with, with indigenous peoples and um, if, if you don't even understand that it's a genocide that's still taking place, then, yeah, I, so many people I've talked to who, who don't have that background, they come out with that perspective. Well, this is how the world is. Like, what are we going to do? You know, what can we go back and fix? And, uh, or why does it matter? And uh, I just think it's a really, I mean, myopic and almost postmodern view on, hmm. um, on what's happened with, with uh, indigenous history. But... Um, yeah, I just wanted to get your take on that because I hear that a lot from people who, you know, either don't care about uh, indigenous peoples or they don't want to engage with the argument that, you know, the land we're living on was stolen um, at the cost of millions of lives. I Yeah, I really like where you're going with this. I really do. Because something I notice a lot in those arguments against reparations is just the total lack of empathy. Mm -hmm. And this is something I just see a lot of in conservative conversations is just the total lack of empathy. And they they really sound sociopathic to me. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and then, so in addition to sort of fundamentally just not caring about those who are suffering, then, then they wheel in gaslighting and sort of create this version of history that is totally false. Or, or they, I should say this, they create a version of history that only takes certain viewpoints into consideration, right? Mm -hmm. that, that totally denies the victimized viewpoint and the validity of their viewpoint. So it's, it's sort of psychologically pathological, this, this unwillingness to look at history from a different viewpoint and this mm -hmm. unwillingness to think about how to create a better world. And, and not only that, I want to say something else mean about them. Um, I have to wonder, is it, is it your own position of comfort mm -hmm. that prevents you from even imagining Absolutely. that other people are having an experience different from yours? Is, is that, so it's almost like this lack of imagination sort of has a corollary in this lack of concern for others right. beyond oneself. Right. And I think it also has a lot to do with what we talked about earlier about, you know, people have just been taught lies and, um, you know, we're propagandized from birth, basically, that, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and, you know, we, we're taught all these things that are just complete falsehoods. And it's really hard to break people out of that mindset and to get them to recognize that what they think they know is not reality. And um, that's, that's going to be a huge issue. That's why I'm glad we're having this conversation, because I feel like the more it's talked about, the more ears it reaches, you know, the more minds it will change potentially. Um, but, yeah, I think that, you know, our education system in this country fails us horribly, especially on this issue. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how we combat that other than just talking about it over and over and over and over again. But, um, yeah, I definitely think that there's a serious lack of empathy, but also just a monumental lack of education. Absolutely. And I don't know what you think about Gen Z, but I'm loving Gen Z. I love I Gen Z. I am <laughs> loving Gen Z. And, and yeah. I think one of the reasons we can take hope in them is that they're so into sort of what's real and they're so connected with each other. They are so connected with, with people they don't even know, people they've never even met. They're having impactful friendships with these people that they've met through Snapchat and TikTok. Um, I was with my kids yesterday and they were talking about Trump shutting down TikTok, mom. He hates what's happening on TikTok. <laughs> he hates that we're all talking to each other. He hates that we all have access to each other and they're shutting it down and my TikTok keeps glitching, but we're not going to let him do it, right? All this is, and I just, I take so much hope in that, that yeah. they are so connected to each other and they are so sort of willing to get in front of their cameras and to talk with people 
about mm. about about issues that matter and and they're willing to sort of decolonize themselves and to and to challenge these mm-hmm. ideas mm-hmm. that are foisted behind uh, upon them in school yeah i agree i agree i think there there is a lot of hope in um the new generations if you want to call them that uh they're getting woke, if you want to say that. I don't like using that term, but uh, uh, yeah. One of the, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, as we wrap up, is um, I guess somewhat related to uh, you know the overall subject of of this discussion, um, but people who so. Elizabeth Warren comes to mind, right? But people who sort of expropriate, um, you know, indigenous identity when it's convenient for them. Um, and uh, also Ward Churchill comes to mind. Um, I'm not exactly sure, you know, what the deal is with him. I know it, like some people accept that he's an in, he has indigenous heritage and other people say he's a fake. If you go on the if you go on Ames website, it says he's a fake. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that. And also, just looking at Ames website, there's I didn't find anything on there about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So I'm um, I'm hoping you can speak to that as well. Hi, yeah, yeah. Okay, you've thrown me into the deep end of the pool, but I will jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing I want to say is thank you for bringing up pretendians at the end of the interview and not at the beginning. You know, you, you, you took what the media would normally just jump on and you were like, that's not that important. Let's scoot that over here. So thank you. Um, sure. so, so pretendians, um, or pretending pretendians. Yeah. I think that's how you would say it. Yeah. So, so the, the tremendous damage that they do is that the conversation that we just had doesn't usually happen because we're talking about Elizabeth Warren, mm-hmm. right? So you you never end up in conversations about tribal sovereignty. You never end up in conversations about MMIWG because you're sort of just desperately trying to show that Elizabeth Warren is not a native person and why she's not a native person and how native identity functions in native communities. Mm-hmm. So. So those are the first two things I want to say about that. So on the topic of people, of ethnic fraud, let's call it ethnic fraud. So there is a sort of history in in the United States of folks claiming an indigenous heritage of some kind. Now, that can be the result of all sorts of motivations. One could be greed that a person sees that if they claim an indigenous identity, it can help their career, which is ultimately great, right? If you're trying to sort of shore up your career, you're you're trying to make money (laughs) or you're trying to make sure you make more money in the future. And and no shame in that game, we all need money, but um, that's that's one reason. And I would put Elizabeth Warren in that camp personally, is that she began this identification when she was in college and then she continued this identification of being Cherokee as a professor. So but I associate that. She, she used that, that to get into college. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then, and then that continued once she was hired as a, as a faculty member. Mm-hmm. So my understanding is not that she did this her whole life, but that she did this when at that, at that moment that you're leaving your family's home and you're sort of creating a path for yourself into the future to take care of yourself. So I associate her with the greed part of ethnic fraud. Um, and the damage though, that this caused and is causing is that it prevents non-native people from really understanding indigenous identity. And it really prevents them from understanding what I said at the beginning, which which is that I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation, which means I have a legal standing in the tribe as a legal member of the tribe. And that's not my legal claim, that's the nation's legal claim. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth Warren has sort of prevented people, non-native people from understanding that some native people root their identity in that legal manifestation of tribal sovereignty. 
And that's why indigenous critics say that she's hurt tribal sovereignty because she has damaged the possibility of non-natives understanding that when an indigenous person says they're an indigenous person, this is really a claim made on the basis of tribal sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the word Churchill case. Yes, that was like a tremendous loss. I mean, I enjoyed his writing as, as a graduate student. I really enjoyed his writing. I mean, he sort of has this hard hitting critique, right. he sort of hates white people. He's like a great writer. He's funny. Um, so it was pretty tragic when it came out that he wasn't actually indigenous. Um, so the, these fakes sort of really do tremendous damage to native people who have spent their lives trying to educate the public about the true issues in the community, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it also does this tremendous disservice to the non-native community in that these people are often in the public eye, right? And so it sort of really sort of grounds the conversation in their particular identity. So it's just a tremendous loss. Um, now the question of AIM, where I'm really, really, really going to go out on a limb here. Uh, so AIM has a history of being very macho. Mm -hmm. So That's I would like to say that is a learned you, behavior. <laughs> that, I'm sorry, what? I said that's for you, Russell Banks. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so of course, I'm not saying every person that was involved in AIM and is continuing to be involved in AIM is a misogynist. I am not saying that. Right. What I am saying is that misogyny was not a cultural value amongst any nation in the United States prior to contact. Um, that that misogyny has been learned from colonizers. So we see misogyny, we saw misogyny in AIM to a certain extent in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and that has continued. In many ways, the leaders of AIM tend to be men, and some of those men um, have attitudes about women um, that are not progressive. So it doesn't really surprise me that there's not much or potentially anything about the missing and murdered indigenous women's crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is another part of the problem of the crisis is that now you do have indigenous on indigenous crime. And guess what? The indigenous on indigenous crime is very often prosecuted and charged and convicted. Whereas white on indigenous crime is not even usually, a, there's not even usually an arrest. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that ends up tying everything together. Yeah. To yeah. end on the question of why isn't AIM taking a strong position um, for native women and girls. Yeah, so it's basically a boys club. <laughs> oh, you made me cough. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely not say that. I do not want that quote to go viral on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that, that was Jesse said that. That was Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you want to do a reading on this, though, um, Lakota Woman was a really popular autobiography written by a woman who was sort of a center, central figure in AIM and was oh. at Pine Ridge and even gave birth during the siege at Pine Ridge. Um, and then she wrote a second autobiography kind of exposing the misogyny that she saw in the movement. So the, the first autobiography is kind of a celebration of AIM, and then the second is sort of an expose. Yeah. If, if and, readers want to it, know, I mean, listeners want to know more. Yeah, and the reason I, I bring up that question about AIM is because, um, you know, quite contrary to the BIA, they, they're, they're more of a... I don't know if you could say they're like grassroots or even revolutionary anymore, but they have that legacy at least. Okay. Um, That's and accurate. It, it, it just surprised me when I went to their website that they didn't have, um, they don't even have a page on, on this, this genocide that's happening. Um, and I thought they were this sort of progressive wing of, uh, you know, the indigenous people's uh, movement but 
yeah, apparently, as you said, it's uh, it's very um, male driven and uh, apparently not that important to them. Well, I mean, I, I don't really want to paint with a broad stroke that way. And there's certainly a lot of, of good they've done, especially in places like Minneapolis. There's um, the Little Earth Housing Project there is a direct outgrowth of AIM. Um, there's a tremendous cultural center in Minneapolis that partly is created by AIM. I mean, I've been involved with local AIM groups as well. Um, so, you know, let's not sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're certainly in favor of tribal sovereignty. They're certainly against police brutality. They've certainly been working against that for decades. Um, but the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women acronym even comes out of Idle No More, which has basically nothing to do with AIM. I mean, they're sort of their own group and basically all the founders are women. So that's even where the acronym comes from is I believe Idle No More is the one, are the ones that came up with that particular acronym. Okay. I did not know that. That's and good to know. and they're they're more Canadian based. Oh, okay. Activist movement. Okay. Um, I just want to correct something I said before. I said Russell Banks. That's the novelist. I meant uh, Dennis Banks. Uh, <laughs> so and you might you might have been thinking you probably had Russell in your head because there's also Russell Means. Exactly. That's yeah. Who was the guy in Pocahontas? Yeah. So. <laughs> Russell Banks, if you're watching this. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I should have corrected you, but I had Russell Banks rolling around in my head, and I put those two names together. So. Yeah. I was, <laughs> as soon as I said it, I was I, I was thinking it didn't sound right. And so, yeah. Um, so just wanted to correct the record there. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, just to wrap up, um, where... I mean, people who are concerned about this this crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, what are some resources or actions they can take on their own or on like a grassroots level to to raise awareness or, you know, to do something to combat it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say, number one, you know, we all have social media now. At, at the the very very least I, a person can do is start following indigenous activists, um, and then next level shock repost things from indigenous activists yeah. so that all of your friends and family know that you are in support of ending the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women. So that's like the very least you could do right. is just devote a bit of your social media time to understanding the issue. Um, and to, to reposting when, when applicable and, and just being willing for people in your life to know that you stand in support of indigenous women and girls. Um, the next thing I would say is one of the accounts you could follow is Sovereign Bodies Institute, who I know you're going to be interviewing. Anita, yep. she's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so support them. If, if you can't financially support a group like that, again, at least follow them. Stay, stay informed. So that not only um, are you sort of amplifying their voice in that now they have another follower, but maybe you bring it up in conversation with somebody, something you learned through through Anita, through the Sovereign Bodies Institute, you mentioned it to somebody else and sort of the word and the awareness grows that way. So I'm a big believer in social media, actually, and I think there's tremendous potential there. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all engaging with it. And I mean, almost no one is not. So you may as well use it for, for good. If you can donate to groups like Sovereign Bodies Institute, and there are many, many more, but I just have tremendous respect for Sovereign Bodies Institute because of the board. Their board is uh, tremendous. Sarah Deer is on that board. That yeah. they're community-based, that they're victim-based, in that they truly serve the families of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. I mean, Anita does things like have beating workshops, virtual beating workshops, where families of the missing and murdered are together beating virtually and just talking with each other and supporting each other emotionally. So um, I would say that is the way to do it, is to support the activist groups that are really trying to meet the needs of the families um, and being informed, trying to learn some of these legal issues so that 
you can share it with those in your life because this crisis is not going to end because indigenous people end it. This crisis will end when non-native allies are aware of the crisis and talking with each other about this. Absolutely. I agree. Um, and then lastly, can you just tell us a little bit about the book you're working on? Yes, absolutely. So I'm writing a book on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. I am trying to make it more historical. So I'm trying to go back to say the 17th century. I've mm -hmm. written chapter so far that chapter is about savannah lafontaine gray wind so that is the first chapter that i've written the next chapter i will start working on is about lydia kingfisher who is an oklahoma indigenous person she was cherokee and um basically oh, how do i say it quick quickly um basically she was assaulted and she endured an attempted murder by a man who then became her guardian and took her land by way of becoming her guardian. And he became her guardian after he attempted to murder her. Wow. So that's sort of going to allow me, I mean, my interest is really along the lines of what we've been talking about is, is dispossession, how dispossession, historical dispossession sort of lines up to assault indigenous women. And sort of she's, she's um, a historical example of that. So mine, my book will be six chapters and each chapter will be devoted to one particular woman or girl. Um, and yeah. Excellent. Do you have a title? <laughs> and where can people, where can people, um, I know your other book, um, uh, picturing Indians, native Americans and film is that's for presale right now. Currently where can people get like Amazon or. Yeah. I mean, not that we should promote Amazon, not that no. I would ever. Amazon because they are an ugly, ugly monster of late stage capitalism. Right. Um, but yes, it's available basically everywhere that, that books are sold. Um, it's not. Do it's you have a website where they could order it from rather than Amazon, perhaps? Yes, <laughs> I, the book is with the University of Nebraska Press, so you could certainly okay. order it there. It won't be available until October. Okay. And then, and then hopefully the name of my book will be How to Get Away with Murder. <laughs> <laughs> That's really got your class name that that's excellent <laughs> i know I, I mean i there's some parts of this new world that i'm really loving and that is one of them <laughs> but, that things, things i asked for before the the uprising the answer was always no now the answer is yes <laughs> anything good liza thank you so much for joining us today uh, Jesse, Jesse, thank you. Yeah, I, I thank think we you so it. much. It was and it. thank you again to Dina for um, hooking us up. That was so kind of her to do. She didn't. I don't know her. I've never spoken to her before. We're a brand new show, and mm -hmm. she was so kind and gracious and willing to help us. And I'm so thankful to her for that. It was a very nice thing for her to do. So I'm very, very grateful to her for that. Yeah, I, I, I am as well. And yeah. I'm great for you two for deciding that you cared about something that so many people don't care about. So thank you for caring about indigenous women and girls. And um, you're going to be of blown course. away by your future speakers. And I cannot wait to tune in and hear you talk with Anita and Rosalie. Oh, that's great. Thank yeah, we're you. very excited. We're very excited. So our guest today was uh, has been Liza Black. She's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and an assistant professor of history and Native American and Indigenous Studies at Indiana University Bloomington. Uh, her book, Picturing Indians, Native Americans in Film, 1941 to 1960, is coming out this October. It's available for presale online. Uh, as we just discussed, uh, you can go to uh, University of Nebraska Press and uh, avoid Amazon. And uh, she's currently working on her second book, um, which is focusing on the history of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, which is what we've been talking about today. Liza, thank you so much for talking to us. We really appreciate it. Wado, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.